Do you recognize that inscription? That's at the Magnus Library. That's on the front of the Magnus Library. Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. I think that's interesting that that's inscribed right downtown, and that's going to be part of the text that we're going to read for the lesson this morning. We're going to be talking about the great day coming, and that's a perfect invitation song. I should have uh, pointed that out, but there's a great day coming. The text is Matthew 25, 31 through 46, and let's read that together. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall it say also unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. The close of the Sermon on the Mount, or very near the close, Jesus said a similar thing. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? Then shall I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So at the close of the Sermon on the Mount, he, he reminds them that there's going to be a great judgment where we're going to be held accountable. And in this discourse he's making <coughs> to his disciples, he ends with this scene of judgment as well. Let's remind us of what was happening here. Matthew 24, 1 through 3. It's when he said, overlooking the cities of Jerusalem, he said to his disciples, oh, they were glorying in the temple and its buildings. And Jesus said, not one stone will be left upon another. And so they ask him the question, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And it is as though the apostles thought, well, if the temple's going to be destroyed, that must be the end of the world. So when is that going to happen and what are the signs? And Jesus proceeded to tell them, now there's going to be signs before the destruction of the temple. 
But there's not going to be signs coming at the end of the world. And the destruction of the temple occurs in this generation. But no man knows when the end of the world is going to occur. Matthew 24, 33 through 34. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till these things be fulfilled. That's the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple. But in the very next two verses, he said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour no man knoweth, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then Jesus proceeds to tell them about things coming toward the end of the world. And as he taught them those things, he taught them in parables. You know, I remember he told them about well, it'll be like the, the thief coming in the night. It will be like the, the man coming back to find his servants and, and some will be working and some will not be working. He told them about the ten virgins. Remember the, the, the five that were ready for the coming of the bridegroom and the, and the five that were unprepared and not ready when he came. And he told them that parable of the talents where the, he gave those different amounts of money to entrusted it to those men and, and how they had performed and what judgment they would have for, for how they would give an account. And so he's telling them all these things to watch and be ready and to stay ready for his coming again. And then he describes the scene of judgment. And he's not talking to them in parables anymore. This is the real thing. Now some people would say, well, it's the parable of the sheep and the goats. But it's not a parable. This is a simile. I want you to notice what Jesus said. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he shall sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now the little word as there marks this is a simile. When you have a simile, you compare one thing to another thing to, to really help the pictures be clearly seen and very vivid. And so we can see this picture of a, of a shepherd and, and here comes the flock and he's pulling his sheep away from the, all the animals and he's letting the goats go to one side and the, and the sheep he's bringing into his fold or here the, the right hand and the left hand as he calls them. But the separation here is real. And it had been preached long before by David in Psalm 1 and verse 5, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Jesus begins telling them about this judgment. He says, the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Now when you read that expression, the Son of Man, this is Jesus referring to himself. And I want us to think about the humanity of Jesus. And if Jesus is among men, he is here in his humility. But when he comes back again, he's going to come back in his glory. And it says he'll sit, he'll come with his holy angels and sit on the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all the nations. It'll be the greatest assembly that there ever was. And if we pull the other accounts into this, we see all the dead shall be raised. And all that have ever lived since Adam was in that garden that we gathered before him. And that's where he's going to start separating the sheep from the goats. And the criteria at this judgment, the way Jesus is describing it here, has to do with how we've treated our fellow man. I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. Sick and you visited me. In prison and you came into me. And then again, 
<coughs> and those that are judged harshly. I was a hunger, you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, you visited me not. So the criteria he's talking about is how have you treated your fellow man? Now it has been said that at that last judgment, we're not going to be judged about how pure we are in doctrine, but how well we have treated one another in love. Well, let's be careful what we say. If you want to know what the Bible teaches about something, you have to put it all together and not just pick one part. And we don't want to forget that in Matthew 16 and verse 12, Jesus had said, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. He says in Matthew 15, 14, they be blind leaders of the blind and if the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the ditch. He says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 1, but there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false prophets among you who probably shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. He says in 1 Tim 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. He's putting Timothy on notice. You're going to be held accountable for the things that you preach. And then Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36 and 37, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy word shalt thou be justified, and by thy word shalt thou be condemned. So what do we draw from this then? That Jesus here on this day of judgment is holding men accountable for their works. Well, let's rephrase that. On that last judgment day, we're not going to be judged by how pure we are in doctrine only, but on how well we have treated our brethren with love also. And so, pure religion. And undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. 1 John 4 and verse 21, and this commandment we have from him, he who loved God, see that he loved his brother also. In Galatians 6.10, as we therefore have opportunity to do good unto all men, uh, especially those who are the household of faith. And so let's get the doctrine right. We're going to be judged on what we teach and what we believe, and so we want to get that right. But that's not all. We're going to be judged on how well we treated each other. And if our religion is pure, if it amounts to anything, it doesn't just result in having the right thoughts and ideas, but it's got to result in having the right actions toward one another as well. In Matthew 25, 37 through 39. Jesus says, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered or fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink, or when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee, or when saw we sick or in prison and came unto thee? You see, those who are commended for these things act like, Wait a minute, I don't, I don't remember doing this. When was it that we helped you, Lord? And it indicates here that they were not out trying to do good for their fellow man to try to work their way to heaven or to, to earn their way to heaven. That if I be good enough to my brethren, I'll get to heaven. That's not what was motivating them. They had simply learned the love of Christ and the love of God that had been shed upon them. And their response to that was to love their brothers. And when we think about how that God has loved us and then, 
and then look around at everyone here and you say, well, now God's loved everyone here. If we love God, we're going to love the people he loved, aren't we? And so since he loved mankind, that's what's going to happen with us if we truly believe and truly understand. We're going to show that love for mankind. Not because of a reward we're going to get out of it, just simply out of the, the glory of the love that is there and we want to love the things God loves and the people that God loves. But after he explained this and said this, then those on his left hand say, then shall they answer him, so it, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger or a thirst or a stranger or naked or sick and in prison and did not minister unto thee? And, and it seems a whole different matter here when they're saying that. says, well, now, wait a minute. Well, when, when, didn't we, why, when do you say we didn't do this? And so here's the answer that Jesus gave, and it, it's on the inscription in front of that library. And I've pulled two verses together here that are almost similar with that little parenthesis that I have just so I can show this to you here. In Matthew 25, verses 40 and 45. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it, or have not done it, unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. The least of these, my brethren. Now I want you to think what Jesus has said here. The Son of Man. And how he has identified with the least that is among us. You see, there's a lot of people in this world and their lives are filled with sorrow and grief and Jesus is acquainted with sorrow and grief. He's a man of sorrows. When he came to this world, he didn't come to the high and mighty and to the popular and the cool and the, and, and the rich. He came among the poor and the lowly and lived a life with them and suffered with them. And he saw them suffer. And when those multitudes would gather and he would see them gather together to hear him preach, he would have compassion on them. And he would see their infirmities and he would heal them. He would see them hungry and he would feed them. It was the proud that would reject Jesus and, and he had not much that he could do for them but those humble would come to him, and that's, that's who he would see. And it didn't matter why they were in that situation. Some were in hard straits simply because, well, that they were born into this. Others had come into bad times in their lives because of circumstances, and many, many had brought their problems on themselves. But he loved them all. And he wanted to help everyone regardless of how, how lowly and how wretched they had become. He knew them. And he reaches out his hand to help. And that's the least of these, my brethren. You see, Jesus teaches us how to love each other, doesn't he? And when we look out in this world and we see people, and I'll tell you, we can see some that have really made wrecks out of themselves, haven't we? And we don't need to be like a Pharisee and look on suffering men and have contempt for them. But like our Lord, we ought to have compassion on them and realize that they're the ones Jesus came for. They're the ones Jesus came to heal and to help. He's going to use us to do that. We're going to reach our, our hands to the most helpless and the most miserable and the most wretched and help them. Because Jesus identifies with them. He says, that's how you can help me. It reminds me of what Jesus said to to Saul when he was on his way to Damascus and remember Saul's persecuting the church. He said, why persecutest thou me? 
Paul said, well, who art thou, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Jesus identified with his brethren. And when they were being persecuted by Saul, he took that personal, didn't he? And I tell you, when we suffer, and when we're faced with it, he identifies with us too. And he identifies with all those that, that are in need or that are helpless. And these are the things that ought to touch our hearts. It reminds me of 1 John 4 and verse 20. He that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? There's a great day coming. It's going to be the greatest crowd that have ever been assembled. They're going to stand before the greatest judge on the greatest throne. And there's going to be the greatest separation to take place the sheep from the goats. And there's either going to be sheep or there's going to be goats. And there's nothing else in between them. On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter ye at the straight gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So it's either sheep or goats. There's two gates, two ways, two destinations, and two groups of people. The many and the few. And there's not going to be some kind of middle ground here. So on that great day is that great separation. And he's going to render the great verdict that has the greatest punishment and the greatest reward. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then shall he say unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous unto life eternal. So we're going to sing the song. There's a great day coming. And are you ready for the judgment day? And the way to be ready for that day, the reason he's been talking and talking about this and giving them these parables, he wants us to be ready. And he hasn't told us when he's coming, but we know he will. And then it'll all be over. So we've got to prepare beforehand, don't we? Don't just say, Lord, Lord, do the will of the Father which is in heaven and hear and believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then live faithful unto him all the days of your life and show your very love for God in the way that you show it toward your fellow man. And that will be indeed a great day. So with that, I extend the invitation. Come if you need as we stand and sing.